Many universities today are struggling to prepare their students for the kinds of broad systemic challenges that will emerge as an increasing number of scientific discoveries and technological innovations continue to surface. A central question being posed by universities is, how do we help students prepare for the changing nature of work? To cope with these challenges, we need to prepare for careers that may not exist today, but may very well exist in the future. Not only anticipate these kinds of opportunities, but play an active role in creating them. That's why we decided to create this series of talks, focus on how to invest in your skills, choose which problem spaces to tap into, and ultimately create a fulfilling career path. The idea for this series emerged after my sister Livia learned of 80,000 Hours. It's a nonprofit that aims to help individuals make um, the greatest possible impact through their careers. It is a website. Um, it's housed out of Oxford. I recommend you guys check it out. We will all spend, on average, 80,000 hours in our career. So how we choose to spend that time is one of the most important decisions we will ever make. So the goal of this speaker series is to assist us in thinking more critically about the science and technology-driven problem spaces that will demand extra attention in the coming years, and to encourage students to explore how these problems can be turned into opportunities that can transform their career paths. The Future of Work series is currently supported by the Office of the Provost and is co-sponsored by the UC Davis Library. I would like to personally thank everyone who's helped us get this series off the ground and everyone who's continued to support us in our efforts. In particular, thank you to Beth Broom, Mark Vassiotti, Mackenzie Smith, and Colin Milburn for helping us bring this initiative to life. So for each talk, we're going to pair one UC Davis faculty member or administrator with one professional from industry, government, startups, the nonprofit sector, and have both groups interview each other and answer the same questions from different perspectives. So as this series progresses, we plan to explore topics such as data and AI, robotics, clean energy and ag tech, biotech, media, governance, you get the picture. So we hope this ongoing series will embolden you to look beyond job titles and think more adventurously when it comes to what problems you want to solve, be that through working in entirely new industries or helping transform and modernize existing ones. We hope the students in this room will gain exposure to the kinds of exciting new careers being created in both traditional and emerging fields, learn more about the ways in which science and technology are restructuring work and reorganizing our society, and ultimately feel inspired to use their own studies to make a worthwhile contribution. Which brings us to our talk today. Rao Unava is the Dean of the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis and one of the founders of Angie's List. He joined the GSM in 2016 following 32 years at the Ohio State University's Fisher College of Business. He is also on the board of directors of the Ameri American Marketing Association and serves on the board of the Bay Area Council, the largest business-centric public policy organization in the San Francisco region. Passer is an entrepreneur and venture capitalist who was born on a farm in Pakistan. He grew up in the Detroit area and after graduating with an engineering degree from Kettering University, went on to complete his MBA at Harvard's Business School. He was the co-founder and CEO of Talkbin, which was acquired by Google in 2011 before becoming the COO of Y Combinator. In 2017, he left Y Combinator to start Applied Intuition, a technology company that is building advanced software and infrastructure tools for autonomous vehicles. And if you would both like to take just a brief minute to talk about your backgrounds a bit and frame this talk that you guys are going to have. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, I think the uh, you know my my own career has roughly been split into three categories: one, being an engineer; uh, two, being a, a founder. Uh, I've started three companies, and then three, being an investor. And uh, and all of those, I think, uh, experiences have helped inform uh, this topic of, of of career development. How do you pick what areas you should spend your time in? And uh, I think to the theme of this, uh, this, of this series is 100% correct. You have a finite amount of time. How are you going to allocate it? I think a lot of times people really just think about yeah, titles or they go to a job fair at the end of undergrad 
and whatever company they coincidentally get an offer from, that's where they move to, and that's what their friend group is, and they and they find that they've been living there for another 15, 20 years without really being active. Uh, and uh, I've tried to be as active as I possibly can in in each of those each of those chunks of my career. I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, from a background perspective, I come from India, where I got my degree in engineering. Um, after uh, uh, engineering, I thought I would probably uh, branch out a little bit because I felt I was not really a good engineer. I could do well in my coursework, but my heart was not in it. I got into an MBA program, uh, really enjoyed it, and decided that that's the field I would like to spend some time on. I started working, uh, but at then at the same time, I got an opportunity to teach an evening MBA program as I was working. And over a one and a half year period, I started realizing that I was enjoying the teaching part more than uh, I was enjoying my day job. So I decided to come to the uh, United States to get a PhD because this is the place where education quality is the highest in the world. Uh, got my PhD at Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, and uh, continued to work there because uh, uh, through some, some strange uh, set of circumstances, Ohio State made an offer for me to stay back in the faculty. Um, it was an unusual offer, and I decided to stay back and test it out, and then we just stayed back. But one of the nice things about being at a place uh, like Ohio State and also doing an academic uh, kind of a job is that you have a, a lot of freedom as long as you do what you're supposed to be doing, publish good research, do a good job in the classroom, and serve the community. If you have more time, you can do whatever you want with it. And that's where I started uh, uh, getting the itch uh, to start something, um, and and that's that's how Angie's List actually started. Where I was looking for a service provider, couldn't find one because I didn't know how to find one. And then I thought, wouldn't it be nice if you have a database where I can go and get somebody uh, to to take care of my service problem? We did that, and then I continued to do my work. Um, then uh, about 2004, uh, again the itch started happening and started a second company, um, went through that process, uh, learned a lot, and then became a fairly senior administrator at Ohio State. Uh, my time was just being consumed by my administrative work, so I decided to stop the outside activities and uh, focus more on my job because I was getting a paycheck and I, I, I felt I should deserve the paycheck every month. Um, and then an opportunity opened up at UC Davis. Uh, they called and asked if I would be interested. Um, I thought, uh, I'll just try it out. I have not, uh, before that, there were other opportunities that opened up, but I was not interested for some reason. Davis uh, uh, interested me, and um, I, I applied. And I came to realize that I was the only non-sitting dean that they were interviewing. Uh, everybody else was a sitting dean. Um, so I managed to hoodwink quite a few people on this uh, selection committee and uh, uh, managed to uh, pull a job offer out of them. Um, that's where we started about three years ago, um, and I started enjoying myself uh, being in an environment that's as collaborative as this place is, being able to do things that I wanted to do, but I was not able to do elsewhere just because of the kind of people that I work with here. So it's a lot of interesting stuff that we do. Uh, I enjoy my job just because of the fact that we can do so many things with the time that we have. It's an intellectual environment where I am able to talk to some people who are very high caliber individuals and learn almost on a daily basis as we go through this. And then now, you know, we have this opportunity with some great undergrads organizing a program like this and giving us an opportunity to do this. So thank you very much. And Thank you. I mean, thank you both for those introductions. After our speakers have finished up their 45-minute long fireside chat, we'll move on to a Q&A session powered by anonymous polling. To submit your questions, please visit this link and put in this code. We do encourage students to submit their questions throughout the talk as they learn from our speakers in real time. So, with all that being said, Please give a very warm welcome to Rao Unava and Kasser Giannis. My uh, first question is, why wasn't it called Rao's List rather than Angie's List? <laughs> <laughs> There's an a story behind it. Um, um, we, we were in a board meeting in November. Uh, we had just finished the Columbus market. 
We were going to Cleveland, and then we were going to go to uh, Indianapolis. We were calling it United Neighbors of Columbus. And then when we started the Cleveland organization, we would call it United Neighbors of Cleveland. At, at the Indianapolis stage, we thought this doesn't make any sense because there's no branding. Every place is a different name by itself. And uh, Angie was an intern in the company. Um, she was there in the board meeting. And that was the year that Bill Clinton actually got elected. And most people said the reason was because he was endorsed by a lady called Emily. And she had a, an Emily's list. And she endorsed Bill Clinton saying, here's the person who actually will be able to fight for women's rights. And I advise all the women in my list to vote for Bill Clinton. Well, we were thinking, what should we call this company? And we have to have a brand. And somebody looked at Angie and said, how about calling it Angie's List? Obviously, there was one person who had no objection to that Angie. <laughs> and uh, so it became Angie's List. That's a, that's a great story. It's an interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting story. And, uh, um, and, and that brings me to you. It's kind of, I, I see the fantastic career path that you have gone through. You have tried out so many things, which is actually unusual for yeah. many people. And as you do that, sometimes people worry about the risk they're taking. when They switch careers when they go from a steady job that you had in Intel, I suppose, uh, to a startup mode and whatnot. How, how did you make those decisions and how did you evaluate your risk in those things? Yeah, I think, uh, I think one of the, I would say, most uh, common mistakes that people make is risk assessment just in life. Um, it's not something you really learn explicitly, but it's probably the thing that you use on a daily basis. And so there's all this, uh, you know, um, uh, intuition you've built for risk assessment, and it's really anchored in survival rather than like the environment we live in today, which is we're fed, we're clothed, we generally uh, have have shelter. And uh, so for me, I think I've always been oriented towards taking as much risk as possible. Um, and so that's also not really true if you know me because, you know, I don't, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do anything. You wouldn't think I'm a risky person in that sense. So really probably the most uh, specific thing is I'm, uh, I take calculated risks. And so then the question is, okay, what's, how do you know what's a calculated risk versus just a, a, an uncalculated risk? Uh, I think it really depends on the context of the situation. So for me, for instance, the first company that we started, you know, I, I just my way of my background, I was, just grew up poor and my parents were not, you know, educated or didn't have a lot of money. And uh, so we came to the States, obviously, it's the reason why we're here. And, uh, and so for me, like starting a company was initially motivated just by, it's like, oh, I have kind of a weird name. And uh, you, as an immigrant, you kind of have this sensitivity towards being a little bit of an outsider, whether it's warranted or, or not. Um, and I kind of saw my dad get kicked around a lot, and I thought, okay, well, if I start my own company, they can't kind of kick me around. And I think that was the most primal view. Um, but, uh, you know, if you know South Asian households are very much oriented towards big companies, General Motors, Bosch, you know, brands that, that you can, you can uh, kind of hang your, hang your career on. And uh, I think at some point I just realized if you just stay working at these companies, you're just destined to be an employee. And I think for me, I mean, uh, realization was wealth creation. Wealth is not accumulated by being an employee. It's accumulated by being an owner. And to me in Detroit, that was like a really abstract thing. I think in Silicon Valley, in California, more broadly, entrepreneurship is just so much more part of the culture. And uh, so I, for me, that first risk assessment was, okay, how do I make that transition into even getting into a company? And uh, that was, frankly speaking, was saving money. I spent a bunch of years, ultimately saved $30,000, and that was enough for me to pay for myself for one year to start a company. And I think most people just don't think of those tactics. And so they just think broadly, well, there's all this risk of starting a company. Well, if you have money saved up, and you, it's allocated for this purpose, and I, my view is at the end of the year, if nothing, if I can't put together a team, I can't get an ID off the ground, we can't get funding, then I'll go back to a big company. And that's the calculated aspect of it. And I think people are just, they it's just very, have a very binary view. And they view like, well, you got to go all in. You got to max out credit cards. You gotta, or you have to stay at a big company for your whole life. And it's much more nuanced. And so that company didn't work. Uh, and did that rinse and repeat. Did it again. Worked at a big company uh, coming out of business school. 
uh, saved money, did it again, moved out to California. And the second company ultimately was acquired by Google. And then I can't really complain about being poor because I, you know, made, made some money in the process. And so I think the this most recent transition I had from YC to the startup was was also, I think, a risky one in the sense of it, it was a great job. And it's, I mean, frankly, easy. It wasn't a very difficult job. And uh, I think another way that people misallocate risk is the more successful they get, the more risk averse they get, which is actually incorrect. The more educated you are and the more experience you have, the more you can put all the chips on the table. Because if it doesn't work out, you're not going to be homeless, right? You have all of, you have a network of people, you have a reputation, you can get a job almost immediately. And at some point in your career, for most people, you will acquire enough skills that you can basically get a job, period. Like, and so that's when you can really put everything on the, on, on the table. And I think it was, it, I think it's a really important lesson that the more successful you are, the more aggressive you should be with risk taking. And so if you're fortunate enough sitting in the room today, or if you're a student and you do have family who can provide, or you, you have a scholarship and you don't have debt coming out of school, that's the time to take risk. There, there isn't, there isn't, now that's not true if you don't have those factors. And so it is a nuanced answer. And so um, my, yeah, so my, my general view is I think most people misassess risk and think about it in very binary terms rather than a very nuanced term, you know, nuanced approach. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would I'd really push on people to, and, and I think the 80,000 hours, or I, I've always thought of, I did a talk a, a while back where if you're 30, it's like 400 months you have left in your, in your career. Like that's not much. 80,000 hours is a little hard to understand. 400 months, very salient. Like you can remember 24 months ago. So 400, that's a big chunk of that 400. And you're like, oh, whoa, 400 is not a lot. And so I think uh, for me, I always thought about risk in the term of I won't get this time back. <clears throat> you can get brands back and get money. You can all these things. You can't get time back. And so the earlier you can take risk, the better, because you, then the positive outcomes last you a longer time, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. It's also interesting because as I see students over the many years, 30 years of teaching that I have done, there is a significant amount of uh, individual difference variables that yeah, explain sure. that not everybody is made for this and they should not just become an entrepreneur because they should become one. Yeah. The way you code risk is built into you somehow. Of course, there is learning that happens along the way. Uh, and 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 somebody who feels that uh, they may be not wanting, they don't want to take that kind of risk, can still be very entrepreneurial in the company that they work in and rise to the top in that company just because they have been innovative and created some opportunities for themselves. But the whole idea is just to not be worried about failure. Yeah. Because the reason why people think it's risky is because they think they may fail, and that failure and the consequences of failure are coded differently by different people. Yeah, one, I mean, one framework I I've, I've think about, we were often recruiting um, for our company, and uh, uh, there's like a spectrum of your career. On one end, you have uh, uh, being a founder, starting a company, and the other end, you have uh, being a part of a large organization, a Google or something like this. And within the spectrum, um, there are pros and cons. And I think... Folks, only they want the pros on one side and the pros on the other side, and they want none of the cons of either of them, and that's not how it works. And so the question then becomes, okay, well, what are the pros and cons of being on the one extreme versus the other extreme with the spectrum in the middle? So if you're at a five-person company, you can see some of the founder risk, but not all of it. If you're at a, you know, if you're at a, at a thousand-person company, you're maybe more like Google, but not completely. That spectrum is roughly, on big companies, you pay there's, there's suffering almost in everything. So you have to figure out what type of suffering is palatable to you. And so in a big company, suffering is through frustration. You are not, you are not, you're not control of your own career. You're not in control of the projects you work on. You don't have dominion. You don't have agency over what you do. There, I mean, at Google, uh, I mean, we would often have situations where thousand person projects would get summarily, you know, just, just set to turned off. And and uh, there's Google's talking. Literally, it heard me, <laughs> and the phone started talking. This is a, this is modern technology. Uh, and then on the other side is being being a founder. The way you pay for it, or being in a really small company, you pay for it through fear. So you pay frustration on the big company side, and the small company you pay with a fear. And you just have to be okay. Which side am I willing to take? And I think for me, this is very personal. 
I think a lot of the growing up in in the in the situation that I, I grew up in, fear I think wasn't really there because I was always like you're almost starting kind of at, literally at a lower level, and and so frustration was somehow bigger a bigger issue to me, and so I think I do have issue when people say everyone should be a founder or everyone should work at a big company. It's just what what are you willing to take? And so if those are the negatives, frustration on big companies, fear on small companies, what are the positives? One of the positives in a big company is, you know, when you wear that Google hoodie at the airport, people, there is like a social, um, you know, acknowledgement that, uh, hey, you, you are a person in society which is valued because of some things, because of what that brand says on your collar. Uh, and on the, but on the, but you're just an employee. And on, on the, on the founding side, you have agency and you have dominion and you have the small chance of having an outsized wealth outcome. But that's very small. Vast majority of companies don't have that outcome. And so instead of on the founder side, people think of tech startups, I think of more like a laundromat. That's probably a more accurate understanding of what starting a company is like. Nobody looks at laundromats as like super glamorous or sexy, so it's kind of a good, good sense. So it's like, do you want to own a laundromat or do you want to be a grunt at Google? And I think that's a more accurate, you know, cost risk assessment. And of course, there's a lot of nuance here among the spectrum, but I'm just trying to highlight the contrast of the of, of that. And I, I mean, I think being an academic is, is slightly different. I wonder what your view of the spectrum is. It's, it's actually a very nice description that you gave us. Um, one of the things I have observed is, uh, based on what I see with people around me and then my own career as I look at it, the goal actually has been more of what makes me happy. Rest of the things follow themselves. You don't really have to work for anything as long as you know that you're doing something that will make you happy. So I, I was brought up in an environment where uh, very similar in some respects, we didn't have enough money in the family and my mom was giving tuitions to students to make some extra money. And uh, in my fifth grade, I would assist her by teaching first and second grade students who would come to our house to pay extra money to my mom for getting some tuition. So I was doing this education thing from my fifth grade, and it made me happy. And I knew that that's where I will end up ultimately, and the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. Um, so uh, a lot of people, again, are trying to figure out whether they want to do this or that from a, an outsider's analysis, but they should probably look more inward to see what makes you happy and when you do that, success seems to happen naturally because you are doing what you are best at. You're motivated internally because that's what makes you happy. Yeah, I think, uh, so I basically discounted happiness for the vast majority of my life. So uh, whether that's positive or negative is probably for another time. Uh, and I, I do, though, now I feel like I'm very happy at the, at the, at the, at the work that I'm doing. Um, and I reflect on the many years I was unhappy but was just doing it for like the professional acclaim or whatever it is. Um, it's absolutely true. If you enjoy what you're doing, you can do it for a long, long time. And if you don't, it's just like, it's like eating medicine or something. You're just getting through it. And uh, you're never going to be at peak performance doing things you don't like. So out of just pure pragmatic reality, if you just do things that make you happy, you're probably going to be more successful. And I think it's not obvious. I think it wasn't obvious to me when I was younger. Yeah. See that I'm not as young as you are. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, as as you start thinking about the future, uh, things are changing rapidly around us. Um, what are the opportunity areas that you're seeing? Given you have been with the Combinator and then you have started companies, you've yeah. been in the Silicon Valley. What would be some things that we should look forward to? Yeah, so I think, um, so now we're going to talk specifically about high growth ventures. And so this is this is different from the laundromat. This is a subsection of business, um, which is uh, businesses that scale very large. And I think the reason Silicon Valley is known almost globally, I was in, I was in Nigeria a couple of years ago, and I remember the driver had WhatsApp and Google Maps. Like those are the two, and those are, you know, I worked on Google Maps for a bunch of years. I know the WhatsApp guys really well, and it's like, you know, you're halfway around the world and the shadow of Silicon Valley is quite huge. So if you, it's what I'm attracted to is that there's a huge impact. Uh, so within that, within that subsection of business, 
Um, when we were starting this third company, Peter Ludwig, my co-founder and I, we had a very methodical approach. Uh, so this wasn't our first time doing this. And I think anytime folks say that there's one path to starting a company or understanding what the future potential of some market is, it's, it's just not correct. Um, I, I, you know, it wasn't like when I was a little boy, I thought I'm going to build a simulation company. Uh, but that's what we're doing. We're doing this very, you know, I would say obscure infrastructure product um, that though is needed. And so our, our rough uh, path uh, in finding out what are the growing markets is um, we first looked at anything and everything that's interesting that's happening in high growth software businesses. So from enterprise to consumer markets, con social media to hardware, uh, and we ultimately whittled that down to four markets we thought had the feature that they were growing significantly, which is mean, uh, by significant mean like 100% year over year. That was autonomy, self-driving cars, uh, cryptocurrencies, um, voice, and AR, VR. Of all the markets that existed. And that, that created a smaller group, a uh, smaller area for us to look for opportunities in. Peter is also from Detroit, also comes from an automotive background. And it's funny, we were working on a voice thing uh, basically an Alexa for kids, teaching kids when they can't actually use a computer and how to interact with a computer. Um, and we were doing this, we built a demo, my kids were using it, and uh, then we're like, well, what are we doing? Like, uh, we, we're like auto guys, we know autonomy, and, and I think that ultimately led us to autonomy. Um, but that framework of identifying growing markets and then working in those markets, I think is fundamentally a better view than, than joining just any market that exists. And so let me give uh, another framework here, which is if you look at the history of the US, there are these um, uh, epics almost in business. And so fur trade starts off, you have steel, rail, uh, oil, uh, automotive, ultimately, there's all these industries that emerge and they have these peaks, these extreme growths. And all of these historically very successful names like Carnegie and Rockefellers all come from these individual industries. The, the, the Macy's of the world uh, and the retail giants like Sears. Uh, and so when I was at Harvard Business School, Professor Tedlow, he, he made this point that it's better to be mediocre in a high growth market than to be great at a, at a flat market. And I think that's always stuck because I do, I think in my heart of hearts, know I'm mediocre. So I want to just get as much as I can in my back, in, in, in my, you know, in my sales. And, uh, and so just out of pure tactics, of like how to make your life easier, you go to a growing business, you go to growing markets. And the reason growing markets are really advantageous, especially if you're younger, is there are no real experts in those markets. Like even in autonomy, maybe seven years is the, are the deepest experts. I mean, they're just not, there's not a lot of expertise. And so you don't have a real fundamental disadvantage. Also, it's kind of like the analogy I think of is like if you go to a concert on a, on a you know, uh, like on a side of a hill, if you show up early, you can put your towel anywhere and get the best spot. You show up late, you might not have a place to sit, and that's kind of the way markets work. And so if you show up early, um, you might actually be in the wrong spot, but you can move around. You might literally start in the autonomy business and sales and might not like sales, but since the business is growing, you have all these opportunities to move around and try these other areas. Now, if you're in a market that's going through, that's getting ground down and getting smaller and smaller, where even competent people are losing their jobs, then you're, you're, you're in a more difficult position. Yeah. So I think for, for me, first it's identify the market, then try to figure out how do you make, make roads into that market. And I think that's worked well historically through my career. My last company was in mobile, same thing. This is 2010. Mobile is going to grow. We don't know in which way. We couldn't have imagined the, uh, the I mean, even in 2010, people thought mobile was going to be big, but not to the level it is now. And it's not that long ago. And so, so that's probably been an important, important kind of filter. It's actually a very interesting lesson from what you just said. And, and sometimes we miss it, and I want, want to emphasize that and, and, and again ask you, same question again. One of the things that uh, Kassar was talking about was how he went through all the market segments and isolated it to four segments and then ultimately came to this one segment that he wants to pursue. So one can look at it that way, but you can also look at it as he has decided and has the courage to say no 
to the other segments. That takes a, a significant amount of uh, willpower because you're tempted as an entrepreneur or as, a, as anybody who's doing stuff. When there are multiple opportunities, it's very hard to say no to any one opportunity. And that's a sure way of failing because you are now a nobody because you're just catering to too many people. It's confusing. So that lesson of zeroing in on one thing. And as you said, if you're flexible enough that you can move if the market is not going as expected because you're one of the earlier people in there. But the courage to say no is one of the most important attributes, I believe, for the success of almost any individual. And that seems to be something people have difficulty doing in as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think I think also if, if, if I was sitting, if it was me sitting in the audience uh, 12, 15 years ago, um, I would have thought, well, I have no idea how to even get to those four. Uh, the next best thing you can do is to be around people who know those answers, right? And so the, uh, life really is about, the, you know, the adage of the five people you spend the most amount of time with, that is who you are. And, uh, and it's really, really true. So if you want to be in a high growth market, but you don't even know what that is, go to areas like Silicon Valley, there's others, New York is another one, um, where lots of this, these kind of things are happening. And you'll start learning yourself, okay, well, how did these people figure out what were ideas? If you talk to enough founders of successful companies and you ask these questions, patterns emerge. These are not random. Big companies are not built randomly. They're built actually structurally. And that's why the same investors tend to make money again and again, because there are frameworks that actually work. Um, otherwise, it would be a random distribution of returns across investors, and that's certainly not the case. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And in my experience, as I finished my engineering and then ultimately ended up in the business school, the first class I took was uh, a class in organizational behavior. And it was fascinating. It was one of the most interesting classes that I had taken in, in my educational uh, experience. And then we continued with some other classes. I took actually a seminar in Indian ethos and how you should apply those principles from uh, whatever the scriptures were to running your life and so on. And, and I was thinking, huh, you know, I went through this entire engineering degree and never had a chance to take these kinds of courses. Um, when I came here, I was gratified when I saw the way the university system works here. There is a two-year general education curriculum that students take where they actually sample a lot of liberal arts kinds of curriculum before they get into whatever. It could be a liberal arts degree, it could be an engineering degree, but there is a significant exposure to the liberal arts side of the equation. And when I talk to my MBA students who are out for 10 to 12 years, they say, well, if you really ask me, the most important course for me was the organizational behavior course that I took because that told me how I should actually run my organization and so on. So what have you seen in terms of liberal arts, social sciences kinds of people and their contributions to what goes on in this industry? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, um, it's, uh, I think every successful company has to think about these things, these things being organizational behavior. Fundamentally, all a company is when you strip away the brand and you strip away the office, it's just a collection of people uh, who are trying to, who are talking about what are things they can build together. And the core of that is people. And so people dynamics end up dominating companies. And sometimes people call that culture. Sometimes people call it like a, a certain uh, aesthetic a company has or you know, a set of values that the company has. Um, so I think if you're a non-STEM major who wants to go into a STEM field, there's definitely opportunities. Um, also, there's just businesses that lend more to humanities curriculum. Like if you work in consumer goods, the, you know, being an engineer at Pepsi is not as valuable as being a behavioral, behavioral scientist or being a marketer uh, or somebody who understands uh, the way that consumption happens differently globally versus how it happens in, in the West, for instance. And so I think it's a, a mix of some of the things we talked about earlier, which is what are your strengths? What are you trying to get to? What makes you happy? What are growing markets? And then putting that all next to what, you know, what, what, uh, what opportunities exist in front of you. And I think, the, I think the one way that I, again, think about this is if you take that mix of whatever your skills and interests are, 
they're going to, let's say they're X. Each company has a heart. So the heart of Google is fundamentally engineering. So it's, I think, unrealistic to be a marketing person who believes that you will one day run Google. Google is run by an engineer and a product person. So, so, and that's, so that, that's the case for Google. So let's take another company like Bank of America. What's the heart of Bank of America? On the retail side, it is actually a consumer retail experience. And on the investing side, it's investing. So if, if that matches what you like to do, that, those are the types of companies you should go to. So it's finding out what the heart of that organization is and most closely matching to the heart of that organization. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean no salespeople should work at Google because Google is only an engineering company. There's other reasons to work at Google. But if you're trying to maximize and optimize your humanities degree or your non-STEM degree in environment, it means it doesn't, you don't have to go to a STEM company. Like that's an important kind of distinction. There are super high growth companies that are not software companies. <laughs> so I think that's like a really important point to, to understand. I mean, if you look at like I was recently reading Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the growth of Nike. I mean, that's not about engineering. Right? So when you say that uh, you started another company, what, what are the motivational factors that make you want to go do that? I know that you have spoken a little bit about it, yeah. but when, when, you, when you get up every morning, what is it that excites you that says, okay, this is exactly where I would be happy? Happens yeah, I think, uh, I think um, fundamentally between investing and being in a company, the, the fundamental difference is investing is a lone wolf sport. You do it alone, and, the, and the, to some degree, the loners actually do the best. Uh, investing is is like that, and building a high growth company is a team sport. The, the the lone wolves don't do well in that, and I think I just enjoy the team sport, and I think that it took me thirty five years to realize that, um, and I think that's ultimately what motivated me to to say, hey, listen, I I can always invest. Also, like specifically venture investing, it's a great last job because it is easy. Like, I don't think it's very difficult. It's, it's, uh, and I felt like a little bit of a coach on the sideline uh, at YC. I love YC and still, still very you know, close to them. And, 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 and I still do angel invest once in a while. But it, I just felt like I wasn't in, I wasn't using my skills to my full capacity. And so that got me back. And I was like a, you know, it's like a gambling addict. I was, I was leaving the casino and I just have to play one more hand and just, just, just at the, you know, and, but I enjoy it. I really fundamentally enjoy it. And again, I think once you get to a more successful part of your, part of your career, you're, you're less, it, it, and now I have some team members here. If this company goes to zero, I would definitely be sad. So, so, and, but if it went to zero, like, you know, it's not the end of my life. And it's certainly the team is, is a, such a capable team. So we're almost, it's almost work for like, uh, like sport. And I think that's a fantastic way to, 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 to live where you're doing it for enjoyment rather than like you just feel like I got to do this because I need a job. And it's a real privilege and I, I enjoy that privilege. I think we're going to open it up to uh, student questions. That's right. Just slide on in there. Yes. yes. <laughs> and we Having have, a third panelist here. Yes. <laughs> And we have a lot of really great questions. I'm actually not sure how to pick, but I suppose we will start at the very top, which, the one that was upvoted the most, which is, and it's a heavy one. We are hiring, applied.co slash careers. Yes, there you go. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I just had to say that. <laughs> well, then I'll field it to you first. It's, <laughs> what are your thoughts on widespread automation? This, it's a big one. I mean, it's such a huge topic. Um, I, I think the underlying, the underlying point there is: Does widespread automation equal job loss? And are we going to live in some dystopian future where, you know, the, our, our computers are overlords and uh, and we just uh, exist to make them happy? Um, I don't think that's the future. Uh, any, I, let me talk first abstractly about technology progress in society and then very specifically about automation that's happening right now, specifically, let's say, in truck driving or in, 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 in like ride sharing. Uh, broadly speaking, no period in human history as new technology has been introduced have there been less jobs. Uh, it's always been net-net uh, 
uh, cre uh, creative. And so there's many, many reasons. There are jobs that don't exist today, which were very much common jobs 100 years ago. The average examples are elevator operators was, I think, the biggest job in America at a certain point uh, as a single job code. Nobody here thinks that America is worse because we don't have elevator operators. We don't even think about it. That is an automation. The elevator is moving you without a human being in the loop. Um, and there, and you can really go down. Uh, you can just go to your local grocery store and see automation has heavily already taken place. Not only self-checkout, but everything that's happening in the back. Inventory management, goods being moved, automation exists everywhere um, already. So it's not this boogeyman of, Robots will come and take our jobs. And I, I, it's a really strange narrative that currently exists that, that that's going to happen. Uh, but there's no evidence ever in history of that happening. When we get more time, as humans get more time, we do more things, actually. There's always this view that humans, as we had things automate for us, we would become lazy beings and we would just lay at home consuming content. And that's just not what has happened. Every time we've gotten more time and we've gotten more uh, calories, we've gotten more uh, um, security, we actually become more productive. And I think that's a very, very important high-level point about technology progress. Specific in automation, in terms of self-driving vehicles, um, there is uh, a very, very important fact. When you read job reports and it says, like if uh, you know President Trump says something like, hey, we just had 500,000 jobs created or a uh, uh, 250,000 jobs decreased in the last quarter. Those are net changes. There's actually millions of jobs that are actually created and destroyed every quarter in America. So that's only the net change. So when you look at any job code within America, including the big job codes like self-checkout or uh, truck drivers, uh, there's millions of them, but not tens and hundreds of millions. And America is just a 300 million person country. And so there's jobs being destroyed every quarter every month and every week and it just happens below the surface so what's happening those people are not out on the street they are finding other jobs that doesn't necessarily mean and what i'm not implying is we shouldn't look at implications of uh, you know uh how do you retrain people and how do you take folks my father worked in factories how do you take folks who are working in factories and repurpose them i think that's a real question and i think we have to figure out but uh, low on my list is robots taking over jobs and us just kind of hands in pockets wondering what we're going to do next. Uh, that's just not how society works. I think the bigger problem that probably exists and will continue to exist is wealth inequality. And that's a very different problem. Everyone can be employed and there can be huge wealth inequality. And so that's a very different problem. And that is around policy, taxation, uh, capital gains versus income. That, that's a different topic. And sometimes those things are conflated. That Automation equals a few people being very rich, and I don't. I, I think those are those are those are intellectually two separate topics. Yeah, I I agree with a lot of things that you're talking about. Uh, the way I look at it is, um, <clears throat> when automation happens where judgment is not required, human judgment is not required. So there's a lot of routine tasks that are out there which can be done more efficiently, and and therefore. With judgment actually comes one more quality, which is a bias, a bias based on our experiences, our learning, what we know about it. And sometimes it's, it's a good thing. We Say that that person somehow has a knack of seeing something in the future that I'm not able to see. That bias that comes with that individual's knowledge is something we care about, we want it in what we do. So if you, if you take a look at what is being automated, most of the time it's stuff that is routine, it's stuff that can be made more efficient, it's stuff where I don't need judgment. That's the kind of job. Now, the other point that Kassar was making, which is very interesting, and, and the reason for that is we have never been satisfied with what we have as human race. And that's the secret behind why this is not going to be a problem for us, because I'll give you the example of MBA programs. It just gives you an example of what I'm thinking about. If I go back 25 years to MBA programs, we would have a curriculum that we will teach and maybe a small career management unit that will help people find jobs or whatever. Now, the MBA students demand so much more. So we have 
leadership programs and ethics programs and values-based curriculum and uh, more electives than we offered ever before. And there is a lot of recruiting effort that we put into things. We have student experiences. We have gatherings every week for our students because they want to have networking opportunities. We, it's just so many things that we have to do for the same MBA students, which means that the desire of wanting more is what is going to propel the human race forward. So if there is a, quite a bit of automation, if there is actually autonomous cars driving us everywhere we want to go, and then a lot of other stuff is mechanized, it doesn't mean that our desires as human beings will be staying at the level that they are today. We will want more and more things. We are living longer, which means the older people will need more things to take care of them. There are individuals who are saying, I need more types of entertainment than what we have today. So it's just a bunch of other things that we are not even capable of dreaming about today will become the reality later. Somebody has to make them. And they cannot be made by automation. It has to be individuals who are seeing the need, coming up with those kinds of products and so on. So automation will be something that we have to accept and live with because technology is allowing us to do things which we were not able to do before. For example, in the supermarket setting, I, I remember coming here and the checkouts that we are talking about in the supermarket only happened in the 70s. Until then, we didn't have them. So we are talking about progress that we have made. The checkouts didn't change anything. You know, it's just that we are, we are doing it faster. And we are so unhappy if we have only two items in our hands and there is three people in the checkout line that they had to put self-checkouts for us. So there is always something new happening because our desires are going, going to increase. That's yeah, the nature it, of human beings. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really great point. I remember a long time ago I was uh, traveling in Vietnam and um, we're in this village and I uh, met these Italian backpackers and they said, oh, isn't it such a shame that all these tor were tourists? Isn't it a shame that all these tourists are going to come and destroy this uh, quaint village? And I said, you know, it's not a shame for them. They're, they're doing this because they want air conditioning in their house because it's absolutely awful to be here in the summer without air conditioning. So we sometimes project these moral views on other folks and other people, which, so what I'm trying to say is everyone individually is making the decision. So if you really do want to check out and do everything manually, you can. There's a reason we go towards phones and not writing hand writing every letter. It is totally an option for everybody to write hand, hand write every letter and then mail it in the mail. Why don't we do that? Because it's slower and it's less efficient. So we choose to use phones. And so I think the that that's why capitalism fundamentally works in all these diverse geographies and 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 different uh, uh, cultures and socioeconomic uh, uh, realities. It's capitalism is basically focusing that desire, that human desire, into some version of progress for either the individual or the group in some structured monetary fashion. And I think that's why it works. That's why it's worked for for. And I think that's why it'll continue to work. I have, I have a lot more faith in human beings and humanity and. Us generally, I mean, if you look at the broad stroke of humanity, we have moved consistently towards a better existence. It is way better. The good old days were not good, <laughs> to be very clear. It's way better to live. I mean, you live better than even a royal family would live 100 years ago. Not a 1,000, 100 years ago. Like, you have com complete climate control all the time. You wear super comfortable clothes that are basically tailored to your, to your side. I mean, this is a reality that vast majority of humanity has never experienced. And uh, so I think a lot of times we think about the negatives of technological progress while we use our phones to tweet about it. You know, like, it's like, it's like we are adopting this technology that we uh, are grappling with. And uh, the answer isn't, well, let's reject the technology. The answer is these new problems that have emerged, how do we deal with them? There will always be problems. And there will always be suffering. I think this is a view I have. And so the question is, how do you make the best of it? Yeah. Very, it's very great. True. We're going to get like two answers in these 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good answers, though. So <laughs> the next question that's been stuck at the top for quite a while now, and it shifts gears into education uh, and early career preparedness is, how important is your first job out of college, I suppose, for laying the foundation of the rest of your career? And I suppose, how bad is it 
uh, perhaps if you feel like you've screwed up, how much is riding on it? Everything, and you'll never get another chance again. <laughs> Now the, the it's uh, it's it's funny we're 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 in new new grad uh, recruiting cycle right now for our company and so we're I'm talking to new grads basically two to three times a day uh, trying to convince them to you know take take applied or assessing them in an interview context and uh, when I was in those shoes I had a manager who told me your first manager and your first job is hugely important because it basically sets your expectations and I do think that's kind of true. Like it, it like the 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 first two or three years of your professional career are almost like the benchmark of which you always will associate all of your other jobs against, and so I would think about it in that context. Not necessarily that it's your destiny, but it's your benchmark. And so the more, the higher that benchmark can be, and higher again is defined in very different ways for different people. The, the more impactful that first job will be in terms of uh, putting you in, into, into a long-term path that you ultimately enjoy and get a lot of fulfillment and success out of. So uh, I wouldn't think of it so much as in this is the most important job. It's just that this is a benchmark job. And, and <clears throat> what we see the first job as is a place where you learn a lot because until then you have been in the classroom listening to probably some exposition of a theory and how things work. But in your first job is where you start applying some of the things that you have learned. It's not like you take a model that has been discussed in the class and apply it. There's a lot of learning that happens in a university that what we call is incidental learning. It's all around you. And people are saying things and you process them and you store them away and it becomes tacit knowledge that you just go and apply wherever you go. Now, given that, for, for, for what we tell our students at least is that the first job, and it's a very interesting perspective you shared, Kasar, because not only is it a benchmark, but it's also an opportunity for you to train yourself for what comes later. And, and in those days where the careers were mostly corporate careers, we would normally advise students to go to the bigger companies because they have better training programs. You, you, because there are some people who would say, well, can I start in a startup or something like that because they're interested? And we would tell them, no, no, you can always go back to the startup. In those days, when there were not many startups out there. Because the, the IBM's sales training program was one of the best in the world. And if you ever want to have a career in sales, start at IBM if you can get in. Because that training is going to take you very far in life. You can go anywhere you want to go after that. Sales people make a lot of money, and that's the career you want to go into. So the first job is going to be an important job in terms of what you can learn from it. You have to be very confident to know that that may not be your final job, and so you don't have to worry about it. If there is something interesting going on where you feel that you can extend your college education through your first job, take it. Yeah, I think uh, you can almost guarantee that uh, I, I really don't know anybody mid-career who's doing whatever they did first. Mm -hmm. So you can have so some some confidence that whatever you do first is probably not what you're going to do. So that's that's I mean it just says a lot, right? It's like that means you are going to change. And I do think the economy has changed, and I do think what is um, like for instance for me learning you learn a lot more. I think in a small company, there's just so much more weight put on you, right? And with a big company, it's like this preset cogs and you are just one cog in this thing and you're not really exercised a lot. Uh, and oh, the way I always think about like how you make an impact in a company is you're the numerator, the denominator is the number of people. So if it's a huge company, you're just not going to make a huge impact because it's just literally you're one, one 200,000 people uh, of, of, of impact. So, so um, yeah, I think, I think the first job is important. Um, it does set a benchmark, it does set a trajectory. It is where you learn skills, but I wouldn't go don't become one of these people like me and become super neurotic about how the first job is the most. It's, it's, it's just not, frankly, not. Um, the one thing I would say is along, you know, the five people that you kind of spend most time with are who you become. Um, be very thoughtful about where you live. Um, that's really hard to change. Once you tend to go, if you, if you go to move to L.A., you basically set your roots there. That's where you build your personal and private relationships and it's just you're just less likely to move. Um, so that's something that I've always stuck with me. I had a professor at Harvard who said that, like, pick your location before you even pick anything else. Um, and then after that, it's like, who are the type of people I want to be around? And then trying to figure out what job gets you around those people. 
Yeah. Well, there are two questions vying for the top spot now that are both geared more towards Kasur's experiences. But there's a third that I will ask first because it fits in with this theme of preparing for the start of your career quite nicely. And I think it speaks particularly towards Dean Unava's experience, which is the university has one of the most conservative, risk-averse cultures. What needs to change to encourage calculated risk-taking by students and administrators? Um, I think probably that was true, uh, I would say, five to ten years ago. But today we see a lot more risk-taking that's happening within universities. Uh, one example that I, I find fascinating is if you go back about, uh, I would say, 10, 12 years, and you looked at uh, how many incubators were actually in the universities, uh, it's about 20% of the total incubators in the country were in the universities. Today, it's 50% of the incubators are in the universities. And, and there is a reason why that happened. Universities have been, many universities have been funded by state, and therefore their responsibility was to take care of the state's mission and provide education the way they were supposed to. Now, you know, there's a, there's a saying in, in, in educational circles that we were started out as a state university, then we became a state-supported university, and now we are a state-located university. You know, there's barely any support that comes from the state. If I look at UC Davis budget, you're talking about 9%, 10% of the money that's coming from the state. The rest of the money is what we come up with. So when you have that kind of pressure that's put on the university, you start taking risks because you have to now get the money that you need to make that mission happen. And, and I always remember, uh, and, 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 and I'm saying this because I remember in 1999, I was... Uh, I was actually helping my friend pitch an idea to a venture capitalist, and uh, they were they were quite happy. They said they would be willing to put in three to five million dollars, and then they looked at me and said, "So, what is your role going to be?" And I told them, "I'm just a consultant for my friend. I'm going to go back to Ohio and and do what I do there." And they said, "Ah, uh -uh, no, we would like for you to be a part of the marketing group." And I said, oh, okay, if that's the reason why you wouldn't fund this, I would obviously be happy to do that. Uh, let me go back and, uh, you know, apply for leave at Ohio State. And uh, the gentleman said, no, Rao, because when you apply for a leave, after two years, if this fails, you have something to go back to. The only way I will fund this company is if you resign from Ohio State, because I want the fear in you that your family will be on the streets if you don't succeed. Right? I think we are all going through that stage now as universities where we say we don't have the money and we have to educate the people. That's a mission of this university. And so we actually are taking more risks than before. We have a venture catalyst as part of UC Davis. We have the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. There's a whole pipeline that's having 13 companies got started last year from UC Davis. So that type of activity is more and more, and more uh, the case in universities. Research funding is coming in big numbers. UC Davis is in the top 10 in terms of the amount of research funding that they're bringing up. Faculty are starting companies. Uh, so there's a whole lot of activity, even in an environment like UC Davis, that was probably more conservative 15 years ago. So you'll see even more of that happening in the future because universities have to support themselves, can't rely on the state anymore. So that start the image of a conservative institution will not be true anymore because universities will be Quite, quite a bit there, right there, out there, making things happen. That's probably going to be the model that we will follow in this country as a whole. Previously, companies would fund a researcher to do some research, and then they will take the result and make money. And that won't happen as much anymore. These next two questions are geared towards Kessler. And the first one is, what are the top five metrics for showing the success of a corporate incubator? What is the goal of, in of an incubator? And what are the differences between tech incubators versus biotech incubators? A lot of questions there. Yes, um, there were three, that's, to be that's exact. three in one. Uh, the, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to hit them all. Uh, for first and foremost, uh, when, I'll, when I describe as incubator, I'm talking about a private entity, so not a, a public uh, incubator in, in my answers. Uh, for a private funded venture capital incubator, it's very, very simple. They, they, 
it's to make money. This is the goal of these organizations, to be very clear. Sometimes people don't state that because it's in a lot of language about missions for innovation and all these other things. But fundamentally, they're essentially venture capital organizations. They're kind of set up in different ways. There's two types. Sometimes people confuse incubators and accelerators. Incubators, at least in my mind, roughly are where they're actually coming up with ideas with founders and uh, being housed in like one area. And they're literally working together. Where an accelerator is more like a seed investment through some program that usually typically ends in some version of a demo day or some investor meetings. Um, so both of those, though, roughly still have the same job objective, which is they give you, the entrepreneur, um, money. And in return, you sell them some stock of your company, private shares. And then they hope one day that those stocks will be worth a lot of money and they can sell to another entity, an investor, public markets, whoever, and then they can get more money than they actually paid for the stocks initially. So a pretty straightforward model. Um, in terms of the difference between an incubator and a biotech incubator, there are, uh, you could call, call them vertical incubators. There's crypto incubators and there are you know biotech ones. There are real estate ones that are just saying, hey, we're not going to do all types of companies. We're going to do a specific type of companies. And then the entrepreneurs or the investors or the advisors all have a domain experience that they can share uh, with each other. Um, my personal view is I'm not sure those are more successful. There isn't a lot of market evidence that they're more successful. You would think they'd be more successful because it makes a lot of logical sense. But what tends to frankly happen is good ideas tend to just go the, to the best branded investors, regardless if, if they're vertical or just a general investor. So YC gets a huge benefit. It's why Combinator gets a huge benefit of this is generally they're considered to be the best in incubator or accelerator, or whatever you want to call it. And that's just because YC's had the most amount of financial success. So there's a huge number of companies, probably now I think 15, that are worth in the multi-billion dollars of each uh, that YC was the first money in and bought 7% of that company for $150,000, which is a great return. I mean, if you look at an Airbnb, which is worth $30, $40 billion, owning 7% of that, I'm not a PhD in math, but it's more than $150,000 in value. And so I think people, the reason you had this huge explosion in incubators, I think in the last 10 years, is people saw the YC model being very successful. And they're like, holy crap, 20 grand got a billion dollars on the other side. Let me write a ton of $20,000 checks and see if I can catch an Airbnb or a Dropbox or a Cruise or a Stripe or a Reddit or one of these, you know, Twitch or one of these companies that came out of YC. Um, so I think that's also part of it. It was, it was like, oh, the early stage market seems to have a lot of ideas and people are willing to give up 7% of their equity for $20,000. And so that means the market's imbalanced. Therefore, there's going to be a lot more incubators and accelerators that existed. But um in terms of the metrics, uh, the, the first question of like what is success, the only metric that matters is return on capital. Everything else doesn't matter. They, these I incubators and accelerators, they're not fundamentally social organizations. They're, they're, just, they're like investors. And sometimes people like to classify Silicon Valley investors as somehow like really good guys in New York, investors as really bad guys, and maybe that's switching, but um, generally they're all the same guy. <laughs> there, they give you money and they buy your shares and they hope that the shares are worth more in the future. It's not more complicated than that. Um, I think what's nice as a first-time founder, as a second-time founder, about an accelerator incubator is it can give you some of the like paint-by-numbers of how to start a company. And, uh, and just the concept, just the, the aspect of starting a company is itself a skill. Like, it's separate. It's orthogonal to like having a good idea and having technical skills to build a product. There's like a whole aspect of starting a company, which is like, you know, how do I recruit? Where's my office? What type of culture am I setting up? Um, do I file the right tax forms? Did I, you know, all this, all the just crud of having this organization and incubators and startups can really help with that. So you can focus just on the technology, for, for example. Um, so uh, that's a reason to do it. Uh, I think more today, when I was leaving YC, I did a little talk for the partners and uh, one of the biggest pieces you know, near the top of the list that I, I, I fear for, feared for YC is there are actually lots of pre-YC in institutions now. Almost every university has funding uh, vehicles. Almost every uh, 
uh, Affinity Group has, uh, um, you know, has uh, has investment vehicles. There's just a lot more early stage capital. Whereas when I was, our company was a Y Combinator company ten plus years ago. When we started a company, there we didn't know we didn't know where else to go to get money from. Like going to Sequoia or going to Andreessen Horowitz was such a big jump that I was like that we couldn't even get the meetings. And so YC was this nice like step stool into the startup world. But now lots of step stools exist. So if you're a Y Combinator you got to make sure that people are still taking your step stool, which is they're still giving you 7% of their company for $150,000 because there's just a lot more capital provided. So I think the entire incubator accelerator space is just fundamentally different than 10 years ago. I mean, there are thousands of incubators and accelerators now in the world. And so um, and that's good. I think that's net positive. I, I'm, I'm squarely in the, in the camp of like a capitalist economy where it's heavily dominated by small companies. There's, there's nothing that says... Google's and the GM's are truth, or the IBM's are better for society. Um, you can actually have, so what does, the more fundamental question, what does IBM get have, or what does Google have that small companies don't have? Well, they share resources across lots of teams. They have one HR team that's across everybody. They have one marketing team that all the products benefit from. They have one uh, server farm that all the, company, uh, all the individual products benefit from. So if you have a lot of small companies that are loosely associated, they actually get the benefit of a corporation which is literally a cooperative in some sense, but not having some of the downsides of one behemoth organization that has almost like an empire-like desire to exist almost at the cost of society. And so I, I'm not in the camp that large corporations are necessarily the best thing for society. I do believe corporations are very good for society, but not necessarily large corporations. And so incubators, I think, are the early in the pure abstract theoretical academic sense, the early views of, I think, another version of capitalism, which I think will exist, which is owner-operated societies, uh, where more, more ownership happens at the lowest levels. And maybe the old Karl Marx socialist view that everyone ultimately owns something will become true, but in a capitalist framework, not in a socialist framework where you have a central state-controlled entity. We're getting very abstract here, but <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> Well, your brutal honesty is much appreciated, which is perfect for this next question at the oh, top, no. which is a little bit more personal, uh, which is how many of your investments would you say failed during your time as a venture capitalist? And most importantly, can you share some insights into why you think they didn't work out? Uh, it's, that's an easy question. Uh, very few succeeded. So I can tell you the ones that yes. succeeded of the hundreds that have failed. Um, why do companies so uh, like companies succeeding and failing are kind of like families like families that that are that are functional all kind of look boringly similar and families that are dysfunctional are like dysfunctional for many different reasons and so it's like the same with companies it's like the ones that succeed they all look boringly similar and the ones that are dumpster fires are like dumpster fires for a thousand i mean i can tell you every ass every version every uh, uh variable in a company and there's hundreds that can go wrong, I've seen go wrong. Founders that are lazy, uh, founders that are inept, uh, investors that are uh, you know, uh, being too uh, dogmatic about a market, the market not emerging, uh, the market fundamentally changing, the technology not working, there are all of these reasons have killed companies. Probably top of the list, number one is founders not getting along. And their relationship then destroys the foundation upon which the company is built. Uh, there's a great Paul Graham essay, which I would highly recommend, probably the only piece of tech writing I would say, if you're ever gonna read one piece of tech writing, I'd, I'd read it. It's written in October 2006, it was called 18 Mistakes That Kill Startups. And um, it's just, I think, and Paul basically, Paul Graham is a founder of Y Combinator, basically wrote this post, he said, if you avoid these 18 mistakes, you probably have a good chance of making a company. And uh, like number one is like single founder. Number two is like bad location. I can just I won't, I won't go through all of them. It's a good it's a good post to read. Uh, I still believe thirteen years later it's pretty accurate. So let me talk about the companies that succeed, and what and what the characteristics that are that that seem to be uh, common a, a, a across them. Um, the thing the companies that succeed tend to be uh, led by people um, that people want to be. Uh, they want to work for for a bunch of reasons because fundamentally a company is allocating resources. So the founders have to have the ability to allocate capital and have to allocate teams. And so good companies tend to 
have the ability to do those things. And so what's underlying below those two things of allocating capital and teams is they have good ideas and the founders and the leadership are specifically targeted to build in that market. And, um, and I think that's pretty common. Um, other, other kind of common things across companies is uh, that succeed, they tend to be in a growing market. You rarely see really huge companies that are in a stagnant market. That's, what, that's why you don't see like many new Nikes or you don't see many new, what's a stagnant industry like, you know, sweetened beverages. You'll still have some. Vitamin water emerges and a few others. But at a whole, most of that pie is pretty stagnant. And there's just few entrants. Whereas if you look to like ride sharing, everybody's new because that market just literally didn't exist. And so um, the big companies that tend to be successful tend to be in brand new markets and they tend to just, they, when they get something working, they just keep, it just keeps working. Probably one of the most counterintuitive things I learned about companies that work is I've been around probably at least five companies in the high end of 10 companies that have become from, you know, two or three people to worth a billion dollars and or more a thousand employees and just seeing them go from two people to a thousand people which is just a really fascinating experience to witness doordash is in this checker is in this GitLab is in this uh, categories in these categories cruise twitch um little teams that ultimately became huge they every time i would see them they would just be growing they would just be growing like hell or high water summer winter fall always growing and so the truth is the team and the founders are only impacting so much of that growth. The market fundamentally wants that product. So in all of the most important things of successful companies is the market has to demand your product. This is the most important thing. This is the underlying double stars around the market doesn't like the product, the company will not be successful. And all of these other things, founders, all this stuff is trying to get to that to that reality of what generally people call product market fit PMF. But yeah, so, so it, the consistent thing, I'm not talking about the failures, the ones that succeed is they find product market fit. And I guess you could say the ones that fail never find product market fit. But honestly, I've seen good ideas in good markets get destroyed by bad teams. So that's why I wouldn't say it's just about product market fit either. Sorry, a little all over the map there, but... Uh, I am quite sad myself that we will not be able to go through all of the questions because it's looking like we only have time for one more before we close up the evening and do our last minute wrap up. But I do have one more question that I'd like to ask both of you. And it's, and if you could distill it into a sound bite, I guess... The question is, what can we do as university students to prepare ourselves for being entrepreneurial? Because the system is not necessarily set up to prepare us for that. Um, so, plus a jab in there somewhere. <laughs> 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 Mike <cares. laughs> But... Uh, I, you know, I, I think I think the first thing I would say to anybody is that if you are blaming somebody else for not being entrepreneurial, then you're starting at the wrong place. Uh, you, you, that's not how things work. Uh, it means you just don't have it in you to face the, the 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 impediments that are being put in the way. So being entrepreneurial is is a, a curiosity that you develop in you to do something new every day. Uh, you are not happy with the way things are. Uh, you always want to tinker with things and see if there's a better way of doing it. Uh, you don't walk back to your house the same road. You know, you just take a different road just because it's going to be fun to see what it happens. It's just a whole bunch of things that you that you seem to do every day that will actually start giving you some idea of the fact that you are an entrepreneur. Um, coming from India, I recall, in my second grade, the teachers would demand, uh, they would tell you, here is a question, and here is the answer for that question. And then there will be an exam, and I have to write back exactly the same answer, which means you have to uh, learn it by rote and spit it back on the exam. That's how they trained us in my second grade. And uh, the teacher wrote a comment and sent it back to my house saying, we got a problem here with your, your son. That's, my parents received it. 
he is writing the answer, but he's writing it in his own words. He is not following what we are telling him. So it, it's something where you just don't want to accept what is being given to you and you want to do something different. So as long as you have it in you, nothing really can stop you from doing it. And if you have a passion for that and you do it right, more opportunities start opening up for you. Just because people start seeing you as a reliable, like investments, whom do you invest in? Somebody who is being repeatedly successful and is able to see opportunities that I'm not able to see. So you have to demonstrate that and, and you know, just like starting a company and taking it all the way to a thousand employees and maybe an IPO is not an easy process. Becoming a successful entrepreneur in whatever you are doing is not an easy process. There'll be quite a bit of times. I mean, as today I was talking to our CFO saying, man, you know, for every one good week, there are nine bad weeks around here kind of thing. So it's it just you have to go through that. Uh, and, and I don't think the university is stopping you at all. Um, I think the university is actually providing you with a very fertile environment um, in, in ideas, in people, in the networks that you create for yourself. Um, I have personally benefited just by being at UC Delta. Let me give you an example. I taught what is called promotional strategy for 28 years at Ohio State, which is how can you promote your product? And oh, I thought I was an expert at this at this point. I'm doing a good job in my classroom. I spent three years at UC Davis, and for the first time, I started questioning, am I selling the right product? Is this the right thing to do for the society? Where did I get that idea from? It's from the people around here. And now I'm totally different in my thinking about certain things that I'm doing. But that's because of the community around you. You can say they are not being very aggressive or whatever. No, I learned from them because they are the people speaking this kind of values every day in this university. So my, my, my view is it's not the university, it's you if you can make it. I'm loving the honesty. The, um, I think the, I would just start. If, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, you can start. Uh, actually, starting at school is not a bad thing because you have this huge safety net here and you have a lot of resources around you and people who will, uh, who will push you forward. Uh, I do agree with some part of the agency aspect. A founder is somebody who is obsessed with Dominion agency. And, um, and so the world's not going to create an environment for you to start a company. So if you, if you, it's like all creative processes. It requires inspiration from yourself. And the best time is today. Like this is the time to do it. Um, uh, you, because whatever you learn, you'll have more years to apply those learnings from. So if you're interested in being a founder, just do it now. There's, there's, there's no better time, literally. And uh, yeah. This was a great Q&A session. Before we move on to the last things, can we all just give them a round of applause? And that concludes our evening. Thank you all so much for coming.